Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to our session on Pantheon International. Um, so my partner, Andrew Liebus, and, and I will be presenting today. Um, we'll do a quick overview of the market and some of, sort of the burning questions out there about private equity. Um, and then we'll go into a little bit more about how to access private equity. And then Andrew will do a deep dive into, into Pantheon International, which is our, our investment trust. So. Um, there's a little bit of information here about our backgrounds, which you can read at your leisure maybe later. Um, and then just a quick introduction to the manager. So Pantheon has been managing Pantheon International PIP, as we call it, um, since inception, which was 1987. Um, the manager's been around for longer. We started in 1982 in London, um, very quickly became international, opening offices in um, San Francisco, um, Hong Kong, and then um, in New York. Um, so we are a global private equity manager. Um, we invest in primary funds, secondaries, and co-investments. And Andrew will go into that a little bit in, in more detail um, to give you a, a better idea of, um, of what each of those sort of investment strategies um, involves. Um, but importantly, Pantheon has um, about 42 billion under management, um, and PIP is one of our largest um, clients and very central to us because it's really our sort of window, um, window on the market. Um, we've got about 80 investment professionals out of total staff of around 300. Um, they're scattered across various different offices. Um, and we've invested to date in over 2,000 funds. We've got about 9,500 GPs in our database. So we've got extremely good coverage of the entire private equity market. And we'll go into that a little bit, a little bit uh, further on in the presentation. So I thought I'd start with just a quick update on private equity, private markets, where we're at. Um, there's a lot of headlines about what's going on in private equity, too much capital chasing too few deals, too much money in the market, um, not many IPOs anymore, they're dwindling, um, the whole interaction between public markets, private markets, um, and um, you know, obviously the, the, um, the, the, um, the whole issue of valuation and, and multiples. So over the next few minutes, I'll try and uh, try and sort of um, talk about each of those different different topics and kind of um, hit it hit it head on. So first of all, um, is there too much money? Well, private markets AUM is now um, close to six trillion dollars. Now, private markets includes private equity, private debt. Um, and infrastructure as well. Um, if you just take the private equity element out, it's about three trillion, um, so 2.2 trillion in invested capital and another 1.2 trillion in what we call dry powder, which is money that's sitting there on the sidelines waiting to be invested. So it's been raised by the managers, but not yet in the ground in companies. Um, so that sounds like quite a lot of money and it's been um, growing over the last few years. Um, but if you put private equity in context, sort of a wider context of financial markets, um, it's still a very small part of the entire investment universe. This chart shows the strategic asset allocation of institutional investors to the various um, asset classes. And you can see that at a 3.4% strategic allocation on average, private equity is still quite small, um, certainly dwarfed by developed markets, public equity, and the debt markets. Um, so our contention is that you know, private equity probably has more room to grow. It's certainly not at um, the sort of the five, six, seven percent allocation um, that some of the more sophisticated institutional investors will put private equity at. Another way of thinking about, you know, is, is there too much money? Um, and how big is the market and how big could it be? If you look at private equity as a percentage of GDP, um, even in the most sophisticated and largest private equity market in the world, which is the US, you, you can see that it's only 1.7% of GDP. Um, public markets, however, close to 130% of GDP. So private equity is still a very, very small market. We, we think it's very central because we've spent most of our working lives doing it, um, but the reality is, it's still quite small and there is room to grow. And in the meantime, what's been happening with public markets? Well, over the last 20 years, the number of publicly quoted companies has shrunk. And um, you can see on the chart here, this is sort of an average of, 
of various different countries. We don't have the UK here, but it would be as well about 50%. Um, the number of publicly quoted companies has shrunk by 50% in 20 years. And there's a lot of chatter about this in the press, the financial press, um, about how this is actually restricting investment opportunities for, um, for investors, both institutional investors and private investors, because the number of companies, the number of opportunities um, is, is reducing all the time. And if you look at the stats behind this, and we've actually produced um, quite an interesting white paper um, on the whole phenomenon, um, you'll see that the companies um, which are now on the stock market tend to be older, slower growing, um, and that's really by contrast with the private equity markets where companies tend to be faster growing um, and, um, and, and in some of the high growth sort of technology sectors, which are not as well represented in many cases on public markets. And just to illustrate this a little bit further, um, I've got some examples here of, of, of companies that went, went public, um, having spent some time as private companies. And it's quite interesting to sort of contrast um, the story behind Amazon versus Facebook. Um, Amazon went public after only three years as a, as a private company back in 1997. Um, and it went, it went public with a market cap of less than a billion. It was $626 million. Um, um, now fast forward and look at Facebook. Facebook IPO'd in 2012 after eight years as a private company. Um, and when it IPO'd, it IPO'd with a market cap of $110 billion. So what this illust illustrates actually is that, you know, a, a, a longer time ago, um, private companies would access public markets for their, uh, for growth, for growth capital. Um, in the intervening few years, what's happened is that private markets have now been um, supplying the, the growth capital for these fast growing, exciting, exciting businesses. And in fact, you know, according to Andrew Boyd, today's pre-IPO market has become the IPO market of the past. So in other words, public market investors are not really cashing in on the huge amount of growth um, that's happening um, in these some of the exciting companies. And just to sort of, to sort of hammer it home even further, if you'd been an investor in Amazon um, at the IPO, um, you would have made something like 674 times your money. Um, at IPO. If you've been an investor in Facebook at the IPO, you would have made four times your money. So there's quite a contrast there. The revenue growth rates were just a lot faster post IPO in Amazon versus uh, Facebook. So why, why is this um, sort of affecting us? Well, um, fewer opportunities in, in public markets and private um, equity investors are sort of contributing to the problem because they're taking companies off the stock market. Um, they're doing these public to private transactions, um, fewer IPOs, and then also mergers and acquisitions, which again are reducing the number of publicly quoted companies. So these, these charts just show the delistings, public to privates in Europe and in the US over the last few years. And you can see that um, there's been a big step up in these P2Ps. And we believe this will continue because of the amount of money now in private markets, which are being directed actually towards some of these bigger companies um, where maybe their, um, their sort of correct home is not actually on public markets. So we believe that the corollary really to shrinking public markets are these expanding private markets. Um, it's proved to be um, an interesting place to get access to smaller, higher growth companies. Um, and often the sectors that you find in private equity are not sectors which are as well represented on public markets. Um, institutional investors continue to target private equity. They're putting more and more um, money into the markets. Their allocations are rising um, for a very good reason. They've had very good returns out of um, private equity. They're looking for growth and they're looking for diversification. So we believe fundamentally that private equity will continue to grow evolve. And coming back to my first slide with the amount of money sitting there waiting to be invested, if you look at that dry powder, but you look at the number of investment opportunities that are being created in private markets, it's, it's definitely keeping up. So there's probably about two to three years worth of, um, of, of dry powder waiting to be invested in terms of the number of um, deal opportunities. So we believe that it's more or less in balance actually at the moment. 
So I thought next I'd talk a little bit about the different types of private equity um, and, and go through the whole range um, before Andrew talks about how to access private equity as an asset class and, and what Pantheon International um, can do. So um, private equity really covers a, a huge range of different types of investments. When people talk about private equity, often they're thinking about the sharp end, the venture end, you know, which is the exciting stuff, high tech, um, information technology or healthcare businesses. Um, but that, that's really only a small part of the private equity market. It's about 10%. Um, after venture capital, you get growth capital, which as the name suggests is, um, is money that's then invested in the growth phase of a business, usually minority investments, um, not much leverage. After that, you have mezzanine, um, usually in the form of, of, of debt, but it could be some preferred equity instruments. Um, and these, these tend to be relatively short-term investments. Then you have turnarounds, other sorts of special situations like distressed, um, even things like energy can be put into special situations. But by far the largest segment of private equity is actually the buyout market. Um, and in Europe, actually, it's, it's, it's about 85% of the market. And it varies from um, small mid-market type buyouts, um, really targeting often family-owned companies, all the way through to larger businesses and even some mega buyouts where you're, you are doing things like taking companies private from the, from the stock market. So we participate in, in every stage, every um, part of this, this uh, broad range of investment opportunities, but our focus is really on the small and mid-market buyouts. And that's where we see the most opportunity in terms of um, investment, um, uh, investment opportunities and the way of adding value to the, to the companies. Now, maybe just, just a word on how private equity is typically structured. So private equity um, funds are managed by general partners, um, so known for short as GPs. And the investors in private equity funds are limited partners because they have limited liability, so for shorthand, LPs. Um, the private equity fund acquires the companies. Um, and they can be quite concentrated portfolios, maybe seven or eight companies, or they can be quite wide portfolios of 30 companies. Importantly, the private equity fund manager um, will invest themselves in the fund. Um, so they will have skin in the game, capital at risk. Um, and alongside that, you'll have the institutional investors, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, um, and sometimes sort of high, high net worth foundations endowments. So that's sort of the classic um, construct for a private equity fund. The life cycle, well, it's, it's a very long-term investment. These funds um, usually have a life of 10 to 12 years. Um, the manager will spend uh, upwards of um, a, a few weeks, up to about a year, actually doing the fundraising for the fund. If it's a very high quality fund, um, access constrained with sort of invitation only, then the fundraising can be done in a matter of, a matter of weeks. Um, after the fund is raised, then the manager will go out and find the investment opportunities. They'll usually have an investment period of four to five years. Um, and the reason that they do this is really to have some vintage year diversification so that if, for example, they feel they're investing in a, in a more sort of high valuation period, they can sort of average things down by, by spreading out the investments over a period of time. They'll also diversify the fund by, um, by sector um, or subsector. So if they're a healthcare fund, they won't put everything into one type of healthcare, they'll, they'll, um, they'll spread it out. And then the, the next six to uh, year six to year 10 is when they harvest um, the investments. So they'll realize the investments, exit them either through IPO, which is actually a minority of the exits, or through strategic sales to trade buyers um, or to another private equity fund. And then this is the typical, what we call the J-curve of a, of a private equity fund. So in the first few years, um, essentially the, the manager is, is, is putting the money into the companies. So you get a lot of calls, negative cash flow. Starting from about year three or four, you start getting some realizations from the, the portfolio. And then in years, sort of starting from years four and five, you start to become cash flow neutral and then cash flow positive. And then in the latter parts of the fund's life, um, you're actually just, just harvesting the investments. So what investors in private equity tend to do is they, they have a portfolio of funds um, and therefore they overlay these sorts of J-curves. And if you've got a relatively um, well-established 
uh, portfolio of private equity funds, you actually become self-financing because this is a self-liquidating investment. Put the money in, it comes back. And with a portfolio of funds, you can use the distributions to then fund your calls um, for the new, set of, the new set of funds. So I want to spend a few minutes now talking about um, how private equity creates value, because again, there's a lot of chatter in the press about, you know, private equity is just, you know, applying leverage, um, you know, in the easy days of, of, you know, buy low, sell high are over. So what do private equity managers actually do? Well, um, we believe that because of the very strong corporate governance model, because of the fact that you've got um, very involved, very active managers who are targeting, you know, really rifle shot, targeting the companies, um, uh, influencing the management, um, bringing in people on the boards of directors, bringing in industrial advisors. Um, the, the, there is a huge amount of active management going on, much more than you'd get in public, um, public markets. The managers are in constant contact with the companies um, and they're all pulling in the same direction because typically in a private equity backed company, the company management also has a lot of money at stake in the business. Um, so if, if the company does well, the company management does well, the private equity fund manager does well and the investors or LPs do extremely well as well. So the whole alignment of interest, everything pulls in the same direction. Now the private equity fund manager um, becomes very hands-on, they can replace management, um, they can add to management, they can help influence the strategy of the business. And what's important is after they first invested in the company, they agree what's usually called a 100-day plan with the company management, um, where they set out really the roadmap for what's going to happen to the company. And everybody then does well if, the, um, if that plan gets realised. Um, Typically, a private equity manager may target a company that's never had any sort of institutional capital at all. So it could be family owned, um, where um, there's, there's often some fairly low hanging fruit in terms of value creation. Um, but they may actually buy companies from bigger corporates where they've been a neglected subsidiary or division of, of say, a Siemens or a um, Unilever or something like that. Um, and then they're really able to unlock value by motivating the management and, and, and helping the company grow. Um, importantly, private equity managers can choose their timing. They know they, they, they choose when to enter the company, but also when to exit the company. Um, and they're not worried about um, uh, quarterly, uh, quarterly blips in earnings. In fact, frequently they will invest um, over a long period of time, and that may actually affect short term earnings, but in the long term, they will reap the benefits of that investment. So I talked about adding, adding value, and this is the, the, the stuff that's really sometimes a little bit invisible and the financial press doesn't, I think, doesn't often dig deep into these sorts of areas. But um, what, what's really important, apart from influencing the management and, and, and adding to the management, um, is all the other ways in which the private equity managers get involved with the companies. And more and more uh, managers have on board um, experts in all sorts of um, operational areas, but also in sub-segments of the, of the particular industry where they are investing. So they will be able to provide um, really good, very informed, very experienced um, expertise to the, to the companies. And just to give some examples, um, frequently they'll get involved in um, optimizing supply chains and procurement. Um, from prior investments, they'll have seen ways that things have been done before and have created value and they'll apply that um, toolkit to the, um, to, to the new situation. Increasingly, they're using digitalization, artificial intelligence um, to basically create um, uh, better products, better, um, better routes to market as well for companies. Um, and they're using digitalization both as an opportunity, um, but also defensively as well. So that's quite important. And then last but not least, um, they will help the company grow. So private equity is really all about growth. Um, and it, whether it's to invest in new products or whether it's to help the company expand um, either through M&A or organically, um, the private equity manager will be targeting a very high rate of growth for earnings. And if you look through the portfolio um, that we have and you look at the average rate of revenue growth and earnings growth of our companies versus public markets in the same sectors, you'll see there's a, there's a great deal more growth in um, private equity backed companies really for all the reasons that I've, that I've talked about here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew, who'll talk about how do you access the private equity opportunity. Uh, thank you. Um, 
So, uh, accessing the, the world of, of private equity, I, I suppose it's, it's our contention. And, and um, in a world that seems to be uh, seeing capital flowing increasingly towards passive uh, strategies, uh, it's important to understand that I suppose ac- uh, private equity is at the most active end of the, of the spectrum. It has got very good record of generating consistently good performance above what is typically achievable in broader equity markets, even in the, in, even in the active equity markets. So it's our contention actually that this is not something that should be viewed as a, as a sort of exotic flavor, um, marginal uh, alternative. It's really quite mainstream. And I think that the, the, the points that Helen was making in terms of the shrinkage of opportunities in the public markets, the growing expertise um, that exists within the private markets, and now the growing amount of capital in the private markets, we think this is a real secular shift. And we think that we are part way along a very substantial growth for private markets over, over time. Because the efficiency of the relationship between owner and management, we think is unparalleled um, actually in other parts of the market. It is a very efficient, very aligned relationship, which has driven excellent performance. So how do you access it? <clears throat> um, we're gonna use terms like things like primary fund, by which we really mean investing in the fund when it's first raised, uh, a new fund. Pension funds are the are the, um, the classic investor in the DB pension fund community. Uh, typically, uh, investing between five and ten percent um, in this part of the world. Uh, sometimes more in the states. Um, secondary funds, uh, again, these are funds that specialize in buying second-hand interests in private equity funds. So when I talk about secondaries, which is something that Pantheon International is very um, active in, um, that's what I'm I'm referring to. Um, being able to combine the two strategies, as I'll, as I'll develop um, in, our, in my explanation of, 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 of Pantheon strategy, um, is, is really quite helpful because it enables us to combine strategic access to good quality primary managers uh, while also buying more mature assets so that we get earlier cash flows. So you can improve the cash flow profile of your um, investment by combining these two activities. There are also very important um, uh, information benefits of of buying secondaries as as an experienced investor in this market, which is why we're so interested in doing it. Co-investment is is another great opportunity for us to buy directly into the companies in which our private equity managers are investing at their invitation alongside them. Uh, And essentially they're using our capital to top up um, which enables them to have a slightly more f- flexible capital base, but we get that managed. We get that capital managed free, so that's a very important advantage in in developing and and getting the best out of our relationships. Fund of funds speaks for itself. I don't think I need to explain that. Listed private equity is obviously um, what we're here to talk about today. Um, it's a wonderful way to access this asset class. I can't tell you how much work those pension funds have to put into owning this asset class because of the sort of administration, the the legal um, uh, agreements that need to be signed in order to commit to these vehicles, the management of cash flows, et cetera. We do all of that for you as as shareholders in PIP. So it's a really easy way to get institutional quality access to best of breed managers globally. And that's what we're doing and that's what we're providing you. The advantages of a closed-end fund, of course, um, which, which PIP is, is that we never have to sell assets to pay you because you want to redeem. You can, you can sell in the market. So your liquidity um, is, is through, the, through the stock market. So um, PIP itself, a reminder for those that aren't yet invested, um, we, um, we're a FTSE 250 company, um, one of the largest private equity vehicles on the London Stock Exchange, 1.4 billion of, of net assets. Um, and over the 32 years that PIP has been listed on the London market, and, and we listed with 12 million pounds of capital in 1987, uh, we've generated an average of 11.7% of annual performance. So that's compounded, and that's been the biggest contributor to our growth to the 1.4 billion. Very consistent. We have rarely made losses in, those, in, those, um, in that period. 
So we've been able to use our, um, our ability to, to construct a portfolio across a globally diversified um, uh, portfolio to smooth the returns over, over time. We're investing in those three channels that I've talked about, and they're really important to each other. The primaries are very important to us in making sure that we're building the platform of relationships through which we gain access to co-investment, but also through which we gain superior information in relation to the assets that we're buying in the secondaries market. So most of what we're buying in the secondaries market is stuff that we already own or are very familiar with through the relationships of the managers that we've already backed. And I can't tell you how important that is. It's a bit like being able to trade on inside information. Of course, it's not inside information technically, and it's a perfectly, it's a perfectly legitimate way of being able to trade. But that, that information advantage, there aren't very many asset markets in which you can generate returns by having better information uh, than others in a financial market context. So it's a really important opportunity. And as you can see, it represents a significant part of our portfolio at about 42%. Primaries, as I said, are an important part of the platform that we create at Pantheon uh, at 26%, and co-investments, important in bringing down the cost of, of our uh, overall net investment to uh, at representing about 32%. So those are key ingredients in generating the outperformance that we have. Our outperformance, we think, is attributable to a number of factors too. Um, it's partly our focus on the mid-market, so the 19 and 35% really being focused on enterprise value companies in the sort of 50 to 500 million power, uh, um, euro or, or dollar range. Um, and that's supplemented by opportunities that we see, we, we call them special situations, that can be distressed debt or, or mezzanine from time to time, or in, in this case, um, significantly in the, in the energy sector. And then a little bit in venture on a very rifle shot basis where we can get get um, access to very high quality managers who are generating consistently good returns in that market. So again, our construction here is all about generating that excess return. Similarly, we have investment teams um, globally, so we've offices around the world, 80 um, plus people in our investment teams out of our 300 people globally. And that's led to our portfolio um, being uh, represented over half in the States 25% uh, in Europe, and then the other geographies that, um, that you can see being a minority. So as, as a balanced portfolio, we have a number of, of um, factors uh, that lead to our diversification, diversified risk profile. And all of that, I think, enhances the quality of the return that we're delivering. So not only is it a high return, but it's good quality and it's been consistent over time. One other factor that we pay very close attention to because we think it does bring down the risk of, of, of giving access to this, to this asset class is the way that we construct the maturity profile of our, of our investments. We make sure, and we can do this by deciding to do either more in mature investments in the secondary market or more in the less mature investments in the primary market, we can control our average maturity. And that's an important factor because we want to keep that well within this value creation period, which is the sort of earlier years that Helen described where value is being created, but also a little bit in the harvest period so that we've always got a tendency to be cash generative. PIP will be and will remain and has been and has remained cash generative over the last 32 years. And that mitigates your risk as a shareholder. We don't have to take on huge financial risk, and we know that we can control the degree to which we generate cash over time. So that's a really important way that we can use the flexibility that we have um, with the relationships that we have in the market to control uh, the quality and the risks of our portfolio. How else do we generate that excess performance? Well, part of it is, is, a, is an orientation towards high growth, smaller businesses, but also businesses operating in areas of the market that we think uh, are um, capable of, of, of growing at, a, at a, a, a better pace. So information technology is an important part of our, of our um, portfolio, about a quarter of it. Um, opportunities in the consumer sector, and again, private equity loves businesses that have very sort of resilient um, revenue lines so that it, it knows what capital structures it can put on. So even within the consumer, 
there are really quite resilient areas and education services is just an example of, of that, where essentially um, revenues tend to be really quite sticky in these areas, even, even, mm -hmm. even within the consumer market. And then healthcare, demographics globally, emerging markets, but also in developed markets are uh, very supportive of, of good uh, following wins to back up the excess performance that we're looking for in our investments. We'll leave a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, so I'll, um, I'll round off with a couple of comments on the structure. Um, PIP is a, is a um, UK registered um, public limited company. Um, as such, we have a board of directors that oversees uh, our activities. Um, again, I, the, the, the perspective that I have of how much is going on in, in PIP, the risk mitigation that is happening at various levels in PIP, not only, not only at our level where we're, we're managing how we get that return and how we manage the risk of achieving that return, but also all of the underlying managers that we're backing are doing the same thing. So you've got risk man um, management at that level, you've got risk management at our level, and then you've got an oversight of a very experienced uh, board of directors who, um, who bring with them a lot of experience of the finance markets, but also a lot of experience of the private equity markets and oversee what we're doing. So as a package, it's just, um, uh, as I say, it's one of the best you can buy uh, in, terms of, in terms of getting access to this, to this market. And that I think is borne out in, in the returns over time. Um, we're, we're the yellow bit, both our share price and, and net asset value, um, comfortably outperforming uh, the broader equity market indices uh, over very long periods of time. And we know that's sustainable. We know it's sustainable because of the very high quality processes that are underpinning all of the um, returns that we're achieving through, through the managers and the high quality managers that we're selecting. Thank you. <laughs>